you know when you want he's gonna let people in right at the top of the hour so yeah do you want me to start with my screen on screen share or you want to start with you um why don't we start like this and then you can bring it up and that way people can see Great. you and see your face because once you screen share it'll be really small yeah. All right, here we go. Hey, everybody, welcome to today's, to today's session. We'll get started in just a minute here. Give everybody a chance to get into the webinar. Um, just a little housekeeping as everybody's coming in. We uh, have a Q&A function in the Zoom taskbar. We'll have time for Q&A at the end of the session. So please feel free to load up any questions for Dave. Um, and we'll try to get to as many as we can at the back half of the hour. And then other than that, please feel free to use the um, chat function, separate chat function in the Zoom taskbar to introduce yourself and your company and just say hi to the um, rest of the group today. Feel free. So we'll, we'll give everybody just like one or two more minutes and then we'll, we'll, we'll get rolling here. Give it about 60 more seconds and we'll get going. Just letting everybody get into the session. Thanks. Thanks for being prompt, everyone. We appreciate it. <laughs> Good Zoom behaviors. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Zoom etiquette. Hopefully we're all even well though trained. Even though we're all Zoomed out. So thanks for <laughs> being here, even though you're Zoomed out. I appreciate it. <laughs> That's right. That's right, Dave. Uh, but um, yeah, so about one more minute, just letting a few more people in um, before we kick off and thank <laughs> everyone. Thanks for your patience. Thanks for that, Walt. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dave. Um, oh, that, sorry, that's Walt talking to Dave. Thanks, Walt. <laughs> uh, it's like socializing okay. before an event. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, this is our uh, cocktail hour before the before the main show. So, <laughs> are you guys uh, think are you going to back to live events soon? Yeah, we're hoping to. We're looking at some events like Saster. We'll have a booth in October and or end of <laughs> September, and should be interesting. So we'll see what the world looks like come fall. So, Hopefully a little more friendly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, we're looking starting to look at venues like venues, oh, yeah, like getting venues booked. Right. Oh, my goodness. Like, yeah, I know that's going to be a thing here. Very gonna, early. <laughs> yeah. And once they're and I'm feeling they're going to go fairly fast. Right. Yeah, exactly. yeah just like rental cars. Right. Dave? <laughs> for sure. Um, OK, OK. So uh, everybody, thanks for joining. We'll probably still have more people coming into the group. So I'll just reiterate this over um, the chat. But effectively, you know, we're really excited. We've got Dave Parker here today. He's got really great content around um, revenue models and valuations for SaaS and technology companies. Um, just a little quick housekeeping before we get going. There is a separate Q&A and chat function in your Zoom taskbar, which may be floating depending on if you're in full screen or not. Please use the Q&A function and load up as many questions as you have that we can address for Dave. We'll have plenty of time at the end of the um, session, the back half of the hour to get into those. And then outside of that, please do use the, the normal chat function in your Zoom taskbar. Just introduce yourself, your company, just to get acquainted with the rest of the audience here today. But um, without much more ado, I just want to introduce Dave Parker. We're lucky enough to have him here today. He's done pretty much everything you can imagine in the tech and startup space. Uh, he's been a founder, investor, advisor, board member, uh, author now, which uh, relates to our current content today. It's probably the worst business decision I've made, <laughs> the author. <laughs> <laughs> but with, without much further ado, I'll just leave it today. Thanks, everybody, for making it today. You bet. Thanks, Zach. Hey, welcome, everybody. Uh, thanks for taking some time this, uh, this afternoon to, to hang out and talk about how to drive valuations for your startup, both for fundraising and for exit. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen since we're already recording here. And uh, super excited to, to be here with you. So um, quick walkthrough here. You'll find... Um, we'll send out a, a link where all of these uh, information are available. I'll actually just post it up here real quick right now. Um, and, and the follow on to the, to the event, we'll send out um, 
I'll link to those information, that information as well. So thanks for joining and we'll get going. So topic today from an agenda perspective, I'll give you a little bit about me, super brief. Uh, market valuation drivers, the big picture components I get asked a lot uh, when a founders approach and say, hey, Dave, what's my company worth? And the answer is that depends and it's very heuristic driven, not calculus driven. So I'm gonna try to get you as close to calculus today as we can versus just, uh, just heuristics. And I'll give you some of the mechanics for that. We'll talk about the company drivers. We'll talk about the revenue models and how the revenue models impact that. And I'll compare them to the public company comparables for you to give you an idea of why it's important to be, um, to map what you're doing to your public company comps and who ultimately end up, end up being your likely upmarket buyers unless you're planning on going public, which is rad too. I've never done that yet. So I have done a lot of things in the startup world, but I've not taken a company public, which would still be, I would still put that on the list. Like it's still on my checkbox list of stuff to do. It's just crazy hard. So uh, unless you, these days you could do a SPAC, I guess, and every, everybody could, everybody does a SPAC now. So, um, so let me hit this and I'll send you the link. So if you want to follow along on the slides, you can definitely do that. And here it is for, um, yeah. sorry, it's panelists and attendees. That was the one I'm looking for. So there you go. So uh, how that master public company comps we'll get to. So uh, first about me, so five-time founder, Zach said, uh, sold three of those companies, closed two. So I've raised a total of 12 million in, in venture and exited 85, so all singles, so no unicorns, but I'll tell you some of the secret components to unicorns here in a little bit. I used to work for a company that was called Up Global, which was the uh, parent company of Startup Weekend and Startup America. We sold that company to Techstars in uh, 2015. So super quirky one. It was actually the only time I'd ever sold a nonprofit to a for-profit. Usually when you sell a company at the end, you get a wire transfer and you're like, woohoo. And when you sell a nonprofit, you actually get a check and then you get to distribute that money to other nonprofits. So it was kind of a woo. So, but no, not much who. So uh, author of Trajectory Startup, which is uh, now available on Amazon. So we've got some pretty good uh, traction going with that. That's been fun. And a um, couple time VC doesn't seem to stick. I tend to be very founder friendly. Uh, sadly, as a couple time investor, as an angel a year in Seattle, that makes me a super active Seattle angel investor. Um, and I've done a total of 14 transactions, which is where I spend most of my time these days with NextPath Advisors, helping founders actually land the exit on their company. And my 20% time is giving back to community stuff and early stage startup stuff and doing events and things like these. So, uh, so that's me. Um, resources here, DK Parker is the, my blog and, and website. You'll see information there about the content. There's a free excerpt for the 14 revenue models we're gonna talk about that's there. You just uh, click on that link and you'll be able to get access to that, the free excerpt or you can order the book on Amazon. So, um, is what happens frequently is we talk to startup founders like, what's my company worth? What's the most important thing for me to do? And my first advice is ignore the memes. So the product's the most important, the market's the most important, the team's the most important, the, you know, all of these things are the most important. So that ultimately at the end of the day, um, in, in a meme-driven meme -driven society on Twitter and other social medias, the answer is kind of all these things really matter as it relates to driving your enterprise value and your valuation. So I'm going to give you the top drivers. They happen to be the things that most venture capitalists look at as they evaluate the company. So the market tends to be number one. Um, so the analogy here is, though you would hear from some folks, team matters most. I would tell you as it relates to the enterprise value of your company, market actually is the biggest impact driver for your valuation. So which market you're in, who's the upmarket buyer, is it new and nascent like Airbnb, or is it incremental? Right? So new and nascent markets give you the biggest um, upmarket opportunity. And I would tell you most, if not all of the unicorns, if you look at the CB Insights list, are all companies that got launched three, five, 10 years ago in markets that didn't exist at the time that are now multi-billion dollar markets today. So new and nascent markets are the biggest driver as it relates to unicorns. For many of you, you've already chosen your market and it's not new or nascent, which means how do I value my company when it's not a brand new market like that? And we'll get to that too. So team, product, things like stickiness, timing, is your timing good? COVID was a great detail of like tailwinds and headwinds. So, and there was, there looked to be kind of no in between. It was either it created massive headwinds or massive tailwinds. 
uh, competition. So the big component here is, has your competition raised so much money that they've sucked the oxygen out of the room or not? So, because uh, that's, that's a driver on the impact of the business as well. So traction really is early indication of proof from an investor perspective that you can get to something bigger. And it's, it can either come in the form of users or it can come in the form of revenue. So think users if you're B2C, revenue if you're B2B, or things like letters of intent and, and uh, point, uh, proof of concept documents. Uh, unit economics is the next big one, which is really how do we scale the company from spending $1,000 a month on marketing spend to spending $10,000 a month on marketing spend and what's predictable and forecastable about that revenue. And the last piece is really efficient capital, right? So there's a big difference between Snap and Tesla. And I know a VC that invested in Tesla in the early days and when it went public, it was still a great exit for them, but usually they own 10 or 15% of a company by the time it went public. In this case, they were taking so many rounds of funding that their 10 or 15% became a point and a half. So still a great return for sure, but efficient and non-efficient capital will get you to a different investor group or a different buyer group based on who um, the type of company is and what types of deals they like. So those are the top rated um, components of your market drivers from a market perspective. So in that case, I just wanna put the pieces together in a calculus here for you is that a great team in a lousy market is gonna get a meh result. Uh, an okay team in a great market could produce a blockbuster return. So, you know, you look at some of the teams and you're like, wow, that team doesn't seem super strong, but they hit the market really, really well. So a great product with no path to revenue is a bummer, right? So likely gonna fail. And ultimately the one at the bottom is a great market, great team, great product, solid monetization, great execution. That's, that's magic from an investor and, a, and uh, a buyer perspective. So ideally you have those, all of those things. Sometimes you have some, sometimes you don't. So, but that's where the components of all the, the big picture market factors matter. Also category matters a bunch too. So are you selling B2B or are you selling B2C? And as I mentioned, for most of you, you're an existing business. Some of you may be a startup, but most of you have an existing business, you have a target market and you have probably a revenue model already. And most of those things you can't change, but if you're early, you can still change your revenue model. Um, you're probably not gonna change B2B or B2C. You're probably gonna keep selling who you're selling to. And I'm not suggesting you make any changes today. I'm just gonna give you some data of if you can change your revenue model, what might you wanna change it to, right? Based on the data. So business model breakdown real quick, just as a background perspective. Um, when I talk to founders about the business model, there's things that are in your control. So there's, how do you create value? It's the very top circle. That's your product, how much it costs to build the product. It's your market and it's your team. And those are all the expenses associated with building the product. The next component, on the, on the uh, right-hand side is how do you deliver value? And that is your revenue model, your pricing, your marketing and sales and business development. So those are all of your things associated with your cost of selling, including pricing and revenue models. Those are variables that are kind of in your control because in most cases you've already spent the money to build the product. Now the question is, is what's my cost of sales? And do I have efficient cost of sales? And in some cases, big companies look at your digital marketing strategy and say, we just don't get this and you guys do. And we frankly would acquire you because you so get digital marketing and we so don't. So know that that is actually an asset that increases the value of the company. But think about this as breaking down the components of the business model. And then the last piece of the Venn is what's left over, which is really how you capture value for the value created and the, and the value delivered. And that is your top line sales and your net margin. So in some cases, your buyer is gonna look at a multiple of EBITDA, but in most cases, because you're a late stage startup or a middle stage startup, they're gonna look at a multiple of revenues, right? And so your top line revenue growth and putting more money into the growth of the company will matter a lot in the early stage. And if you're taking money off, off the table today through EBITDA, congratulations, uh, that's a good thing. Uh, free cash is an indication of success. Venture, raising venture capital is never uh, an indication of success. So you want to make sure that you, you know that you're, you're spending money on the right things. So that's the quick business model breakdown. So, if, and so creating value, as I mentioned, team, engineering, design, hosting, delivering value is your revenue model choice, your pricing, and your unit economics. 
And what's left over is your top line revenue, gross margins, and net profit. So just a way to break down the revenue, the business model. All right, so how do you monetize? Which is the revenue model component of this? And then we'll get to the public company comps options. So keep in mind, this isn't a calculus. Again, this is a heuristic. So where the data came from was in prep for the book, I went back to Crunchbase and the CEO of Crunchbase at the time and said, hey, um, can you run a list for me of every seed funded company over the last 18 months? And the, the problem I was solving was a founder had come to me and said, hey, can I have your financial model? And like, I can give it to you, but mine's a B2B subscription business and yours is a B2C uh, marketplace business. And those are just different. And the question was that I was trying to solve for at the time, naively enough, was, hey, um, how many revenue model templates, financial model templates would you need to do to cover kind of 80% of the founders? So the thesis was look at these 2,600 fund funded companies and then figure out what the revenue models were in each of the categories, both B2B, B2C, et cetera. Because it took me so long to write the book and because I was CEO off and on of a couple different companies I was getting prepped to sell, we ended up with a five-year longitudinal study unintentionally, right? Um, but what we found was there's 14 revenue models that addressed all the revenue models in tech. And fundamentally, there were two changes in that five-year span. So anybody remember Groupon? So Groupon was one of those examples of like, it was a super new revenue model at the time, but ultimately it became um, commerce and lead gen. So remember how many people copied Groupon? So one of the things about revenue models that's interesting is they're not defensible. So even though you think it may be defensible at the time, they're just not defensible. And there was thousands and thousands of Groupon copies. And we'll get to what Groupon's worth today here at the end of the, uh, end of the update. So, so one thing was that the other one was a new revenue model. Uh, well, there was one that, was a, that wasn't really a revenue model called coins and tokens. So if you remember when those kicked off, the answer was like, this is this new thing called coins and tokens. It wasn't actually a revenue model because there were no unit economics and no metrics you could track. It was a funding mechanic for sure. And the SEC ultimately said, yeah, we don't really think it's a funding mechanic either. And we'll see where it ends up. But at the end of the day, it wasn't a revenue model. It was simply a, a, a funding mechanic. The other one that did mature during that five-year window was this concept of metered services. So if you think back to your early cell phone plan where you, as you use more, you paid more or you use too many text messages for your kids and they got this outrageous bill, that's a pay as you go or a metered service revenue model. And that's really fairly new in the last five years in tech at least with AWS, Azure, companies like Twilio, right? So the, the, the boom of metered services businesses have really boomed a lot over the last five to 10 years, but five years they've become super popular. And we've seen a lot of subscription businesses move from originally like Microsoft did licenses and went into subscription. And now subscriptions are morphing into metered services or a combination of subscription plus metered service. And I'll break down what those things are for you too. We also went back and looked at the, the companies that failed. We looked on the Wayback Machine, which is the internet archive. And we looked at the last cached pages and looked at why do we think they failed? So we actually broke down um, the, the, the data about what those companies were. Some things that were consistent there, and this may fly in the face of some, well, how some of you are doing your pricing page today. Um, consistently, they had a call us for more information about price. So they didn't have any um, pricing published on their site. Um, so there was a value proposition, may have been good, may not have been, but there wasn't really a product page and there wasn't really a price page. So one of the aha learnings there is if you were to err in a direction so we have to assume as a, in the later stage startup, our pricing is always gonna be a little bit wrong, but we wanna to move towards getting it right. Even having the wrong pricing provides a level of transparency to your customer that can help them take action versus call us for price is something that probably doesn't happen very much. The other aha was that most of those companies didn't have a call to action on most of the pages. And one of the things you should have on all those pages, including product and price, et cetera, is you know, book a demo, get the white paper, some sort of CTA that is easy for your customer to react to. But consistently 85% of the companies that failed didn't have a price page at all. So I can't tell you that's the reason they failed. They could have ran out of capital. They could have got squished by a competitor, but consistently it was an interesting observation that 85% of them were that way. So that was the data set we tracked. How did they map? So the thing we tracked here was from the time they did seed from 
seed funding to A funding and from A round funding to B round funding, we track the number of days because what uh, Crunchbase would give us is the dates of the fundraising round and what they call the name of the round. It's a little squishy on the data because Crunchbase is crowdsourced data. So not everybody called the rounds the same thing. So one of the big ahas was seed rounds went from seed one to seed 10. And when I raised my first round, that would have been a series J, right? So, but a lot of early companies were doing differences in the seed rounds. So it was what made it a little squishy, but the point of this slide is uh, there's a couple of outliers. One is um, from seed, um, or from A funding to B funding, you'll see here gaming was super fast. So if you had a gaming uh, revenue model, which typically means selling virtual goods, right, to level up. So think Candy Crush, introduce frustration so the customer will buy an upgrade. Those companies averaged about 600 days, just under 600 days to get their seed funding, but a couple hundred days to get their A their, from their A funding to B funding. So again, bottom line is seed to A and the, the other um, uh, axes is from A round to B round. So they were super fast to get that funding. The other thing up here, which was super interesting is that combination companies, so think um, subscription companies with services, or professional services or non-recurring engineering. Those companies went from, they got funded very quickly from C to A, but about average from A to B. So early validation in the form of revenue in the form of professional services. So in this model, think of like Smartsheet in Seattle has 25% of their revenue, they're publicly traded, and 25% of their revenue is actually professional services because either the enterprise customer has to get trained on the product first before they can deploy it, or they can deploy professional services and ramp up the product and then train the customer. So in, in uh, their case, publicly traded, the market doesn't hammer them for being in the services business, even though it's not great margin compared to subscription. But it was early validation in the form of revenue. And then you have things like big data, transaction fee businesses, product as a service, no big surprises in, in any of these other than um, some of the ones you think would take longer to mature definitely take longer to mature. Advertising and search um, is there right in the, um, here in the middle of the up, upper quadrants. And advertising and search basically requires a certain number of um, unique users to visit your site every month before you can actually monetize that way. So that's kind of how the data broke down. Let me break down the models for you now. And some of you, again, you've already picked your model, but I'll give you the list of the 14 at the end. And my encouragement is think about is should we consider additional or different revenue models than we're currently doing today as a way to extend our revenue multiples? So fee for service is the first one. It's the obvious one. It's the we, we, have, we have a pay rate, we have a bill rate. Dave's our contractor or employee. He's delivering a service for a fee. If our customer pays us um, the bill rate. We pay Dave the pay rate. And what's left over is the gross margin, usually 35 to 50%. And it's really all about people. So the thing here is that even though this is a model successfully used in tech, it doesn't scale. So no big surprise, services businesses don't sell for a great multiple. So know that that's part of the the challenge of being in the services business, especially now where you're recruiting more people. So revenue model number one is services. Number two is called product as a service, which is uh, we, we have people in the back end delivering this service, but um, we've productized it so the customer is actually buying a SKU. So here, if you think about Southwest Airlines, they're in the services business, but when I buy a ticket, I'm buying this the end result, I hope, of getting to a particular location, right? Or a company I'm on the board of in Bellevue um, is a company called Guidant Financial. And Guidant does a service where you can take money and invest your 401k into a self-directed IRA without paying the taxes and fees of taking the money out. So they're basically, you know, form an LLC, do the conversion, put your money in there. And for that cost, um, you basically, uh, it's, they productize the service. There's people involved in doing that work, filing your LLCs and doing that stuff to state level. But from the consumer perspective, it's a, it's a, it's a skew, it's a price point. They buy a thing versus buying, you know, a lawyer's time at six minute increments. So this is productized the service. IBM is also in the services business a lot. And if you remember Xerox, a lot of services. So there's still, you know, they can still productize that service from a customer standpoint, I'm paying a fixed price but I'm getting a combination of people and product on the back end. So uh, these offerings um, apply for both B2B and B2C. Um, Moz or SEO Moz, if you remember them in Seattle, they recently sold. 
um, they started off as a services company and they built tools. And when they got to being a tools business and subscription business, then what they did was they sold off the services business and just went into the product business. So that can be difficult as a founder because the gross margins that are associated with uh, um, making service dollars are actually good gross margins, right? So the, probably the easiest model in this one to bootstrap other than the services business. In the wrong direction. Three is commerce. You guys all know commerce. It ranges from you know Amazon at one end to Wayfair and Lululemon. I picked Wayfair and Lululemon. And Wayfair trades at a multiple of revenue that's much smaller because they're selling other people's products, and Lululemon trades at a much more of a premium. So they're they're selling physical goods in one case, products they warehouse, um, and inventory, but not products they make. In Lululemon's case, products that are actually branded for them. So commerce works in both B two B and B two C. So if you're doing commerce today, you know, your key metrics are wholesale cost of goods sold, average percentage of margin, average basket size, and number of baskets per month. That gives you your, your key unit economic data. Um, this can work in both physical and, and, and virtual goods, both work. Um, and it can mature into a marketplace if you want it to. And there's, there's a, still a question of whether you want it to or not, but there is an opportunity to create a marketplace with additional sellers if you think about how Amazon did it. So that's number three, that's commerce. Four is subscription, super excited about this model these days. There's subscription for everything. Um, you can go to Amazon and get a subscription for LaCroix water delivered to your house every week. Um, per personally, I prefer Topo Chico, but that's just my own preference. So this one works in both B2B and B2C. So think Spotify and Salesforce. So key metrics here, are average revenue per user, um, conversion ratios from trial to paid and churn or in some cases, the, the, the positive equivalent, which is net negative churn. So we think about annual contract value and what's my annual contract value going up on an annual basis for those enterprise type customers. So tiered pricing here is a really important as far as a way to optimize pricing. And again, we'll, we'll pull a list of the public company comps and I'll tell you kind of how they map out as far as from a buyer perspective here at the end. So high multiples on this one, um, investors like uh, SaaS businesses or subscription businesses, I, I tend to think of SaaS as a hosting mechanic and a subscription as a monetization mechanic, but that's me parsing um, details. So number four is subscription. Number five is metered service. This is one of the new ones and I would call it the API economy. So if you know Off the Zero as an example or UiPath, um, Off Zero recently got bought by Okta. Um, so they're basically in the API economy business. So you sign up for a subscription and then as your usage goes up, you pay more. For many of you, that's like AWS and Azure, right? So my, my rental server time is definitely there. So my key metrics are very similar to subscription, but what I'm looking at in addition to subscription is what's my monthly usage pattern by customer profile or by cohort. So what's that, what I'm after here is um, how is the business growing relative to usage? So this is the highest multiple category. So there's a few wacky outliers in the 207 companies I'll show you later, but consistently speaking, metered services has the highest multiple of sales and the, and the buyers who are in this space are going to be the buyers that will pay the most for revenue. So just know that that's, it's, this is definitely aspirational. If you can add metered service to your business, I would encourage you to do so. Transaction fees, rentals, Stripe is a great example here, a Chegg. Chegg is in the rental um, of uh, academic books for colleges. So they basically buy the book that's super expensive, rent it to the student for the term, recycle that book back in and rent it back out again. So they're in the rental business. I group these together because the mechanics are the same of how you monetize. So transaction fee business, um, Stripe makes a transaction fee on every single transaction. Chegg makes a transaction fee, one's a rental, one's a transaction fee, the mechanics are the same. Their key metrics are average transaction revenue, your percentage fee on that transaction, and the number of transactions per month. So that gives you your base level metrics on key, key, key metrics and KPIs. Um, the challenge here, if you're launching a new business in the transaction fee business, think uh, Upwork or Fiverr, um, is not to start the price too low. I realize now both of those examples I gave you were marketplaces, but I'll get to marketplaces next. So the idea here is don't start your transaction fee too low. If you're doing hundreds of thousands of transactions like Stripe, there is a market rate, people will pay for that and it will be way less than 15%. But any, any business that starts in the BIPs or basis points is super hard business to make money on unless you're doing thousands and thousands and thousands of transactions a month. So 
Uh, so that's the number six, the transaction fee business. I'll pick up pace here, by the way, we get into more obscure models here as we get past marketplaces. Marketplaces are folks like Etsy, eBay, Alibaba. They're both B2B and B2C. Some are B2B to C, but a marketplace is a marketplace. It has its own unique dynamic. Your key metrics are average transaction amount, the uh, number of transactions per month and the commission per transaction. So unlike commerce, I don't own the product. So or unlike transaction fee where it's, I'm taking a, a commission percentage, but I'm not actually owning the top line revenue. So I would argue that Groupon never took ownership of the things they sold and they should have just booked the revenue on their commission, but that's just me and you know, gap. So just a different business. So marketplaces though, have two funnels for marketing. I have to have a sell side funnel and I have to have the buy side funnel. So I'm making that transaction fee on the transactions that happen between those two things. Or if you're Amazon, you create high margin products into high volume traffic. So like batteries, right? But they're fundamentally in the marketplace business um, as well as others. They're more of a conglomerate, but we'll get to that later. Combinations are number eight. So I mentioned Smartsheet as an example. We do services, we do subscriptions. Marketplaces, we're seeing a trend in marketplaces. They're starting to mature into, in addition to a marketplace, they're adding a subscription component where the people who pay to post get a slightly better deal if they do a subscription. What that means for you as a company is my predictable form of revenue goes up every month because I have an additional subscription revenue plus transaction revenue on top. So that's a good example of a combination business. Um, in metered services, I may have a subscription plus metered service that goes up as you pay as you go. Uh, or services plus transaction fee. So typically those are the, some of the combinations that we see. Um, so giving an example, hardware and so IoT devices and big data to manage it in the back end. So the IoT device is a hardware sale. The software you manage this is a subscription sale. So that's typically a, an example of combination. So combinations do mature faster because you have early validation in, in revenue. So not necessarily a bad thing. By the way, it, you know, I'm starting to publish this data fairly broadly. VCs will still tell you, pick one revenue model and stick with it because they've never looked at the data and somebody told them that and they just believe it. So uh, don't argue with them and say, Dave said otherwise. It's not, worth, it's not worth the argument. You got better things to do. Gaming, as I said, we started to get more obscure. If you're in the gaming business and you sell virtual swords, I love the margins on virtual swords. Um, there's some, it only works B to C. Uh, your key metrics are number of downloads, percentage of people who play, and average in-app purchase. Most of you don't do that, but the margins are amazing. Number 10 is advertising. The reason it's number 10 is you need to have a million unique users a month before you can monetize in a meaningful way. Let me give you an example. So my blog post, thanks for, for hitting it today. Um, I'm not using advertising. I get between three and 5,000 readers a month. A great CPM rate, cost per thousand rate, would be $35, which would mean I would make between $100 and $150 a month if I sold ads on my site to interrupt you as you read a blog post. Not very exciting. So the question with this model becomes, how, do we, how much money does it cost us to get to a million uniques, right? Because either we have to raise money for that or we have to uh, do things like viral coefficients and, and create viral loops which is new media, which is a good transition. So I think Snapchat, Clubhouse. Clubhouse and Snapchat are great examples of kind of the non-revenue models. Like if you're growing customers this fast, ultimately we know at this point that your revenue model you're gonna choose is going to be advertising. But investors don't really care as long as you can keep the growth up. Your growth is, this one works B2C only. Your growth here is calculated on what's called a, a viral coefficient, which used to be hard to explain before a pandemic and what's called the K factor. So, which is for every customer I buy, do I get more than two additional paid customers for every customer I buy? In the case of Clubhouse, they're not monetizing yet, but in the case of TikTok, there's now videos that are interjected um, that come between the videos as you, you know, scroll up to look at additional videos or they lead with a video. So that pre-roll video has a fee associated with it. It's all about advertising. So if you're doing this, if you have a B2B business you think is going viral, definitely reach out. You would be the first one I've ever seen. Um, I will probably become an investor. Number 12 is big data. The reason this is towards the end of the list is you have to have the big data before you can monetize the data. So I think patients like me is a great example where they have a lot of patient anonymized data 
where you can um, run a query if you're big pharma against a particular data set. But you have to have the data before you can monetize it. So consequently, it's a tougher revenue model to do because it only works at scale. Number 13 is lead generation. So if you know Chime, Chime is the latest version of Mint, which is you can, or if you have Credit Karma on your app, those businesses are in the lead generation business and they're just better at creating leads for credit card companies than the credit card companies themselves or life insurance or homeowners insurance or whatever. So those businesses are basically marketing firms who are better at capturing leads, taking that lead form information, Dave Parker, Dave's email, and Dave's phone number, and then turn around and selling that lead to somebody else. So if you're doing a um, home equity line of credit, um, there's a lot of people playing in that space for lead gen. That's number 13. Last but certainly not least is licensing. Uh, my first company was in the licensing space. We did software licensing with Microsoft. We were their um, first new distributor in 15 years. Grew that company from zero to 32 million in sales in four years. And I remember 15 plus years ago, there was lots of writing in the trade publications like, will Microsoft make the move between licensing to subscription? And there's tons of anxiety. And the answer was, yeah, ultimately kind of a dumb question. It was a great decision on their part. So here's your 14. Um, if you're using one of them today and you think you can add one, like you can, you're can, you doing subscription, you think you might be able to add metered service, I would encourage you to write that as an alternative one. And, and I'm going to get to your why here in just a sec. So those are your 14. So why would you want to do that or look at a new revenue model? So what we did when I wrote the book, and Zach was a pre-reader on the book, is I used examples of you know B2B and B2C and a couple examples. And somebody asked me like, hey, have you done an analysis of public companies and what the multiples are? So that led to this interesting project of like, hmm, how do you compare public company buyers to private company sellers and what the company is worth? So the analysis there we took you through was, we basically took all the revenue models and then made a list of all of the companies and said, here's what those companies sell for. So I'm gonna switch my screen here real quick. Um, and I'll take you to the data that has the public company comp data as well. So what you'll see here is that services companies like Accenture and Stride, Stride's a publicly traded company in the education space, they trade between 0.75 and 1.5 times revenues. So if you're doing, if you and I are co-founders in a company, we're doing a million dollars a year and we're gonna to sell to somebody, they're probably not gonna pay us much more than the 1.5X, maybe 2X, right? Because ultimately they're gonna get revenue recognition from the public markets that are 0.75 to 1.5 times revenues. By contrast, if you're in the subscription business, we're seeing those typically as a multiple of eight to 12 times revenue. So if you came to me and said, hey, Dave, I wanna get my company ready to sell, what's my company gonna sell for? I would look at it and say like, mm, you're kind of looking at it from the standpoint of um, how much revenue you're doing, what's the multiple on revenue within the space, right? And um, there's a bunch of other factors I'll go into for a minute, but that gives you an early range. Like if your customer concentration is too high, or you have a distribution agreement where they're, they're doing all of your sales or you're in a super niche market, like those factors will be factors that push your revenue multiple down. If you're in a new and nascent market, those would be enough factors to push your revenue models up. So the other one I wanna point out to you here is metered service. So you'll see that metered service companies like Twilio, AWS, AWS is obviously buried within Microsoft, or I'm sorry, buried within Amazon, just like Azure is buried within Microsoft. But companies like UiPath actually have really blockbuster numbers by comparison. So if you can add metered service to your revenue model, I would definitely encourage you to do that. If you can optimize your pricing, one of the things you'll see here is that subscription-based companies with optimized pricing have done really, really well in the public markets. So let me take you to that data real quick. So what we did here was we looked at, so take a marathon patent group out of the mix here for a minute as an outlier. They mine Bitcoin as the price of Bitcoin went up as a public entity. You'll see here their sales ratio, um, which is their market cap divided by trailing 12 months revenue. Their sales ratio is ridiculous, like 233. Snowflake that went public this year, 113. To get just to some we talked about here earlier, here's DocuSign. DocuSign is trading it, their market cap divided by their trailing 12 months revenue is 30 times. So if you were selling your company into a DocuSign and you were doing a million dollars, that company could be worth up to $30 million of acquisitive revenue. If DocuSign adds $10 million of new revenue this year, 
they're gonna add $300 million in market cap at the current rate. And you'll see here that what we did is we took their trailing five quarters to try to standardize around visibility of like, um, compared to this. And I think your 15.14 here represents pre-COVID. And then you'll see the 1936 represented COVID tailwinds as well. You'll see the same thing tr true up here with Shopify and Zoom, right? So 40, 55 times, 67 times. But the consistent trend here is companies who have done a really good job optimizing their pricing around subscriptions are trading in the mid 30s. Companies that are, have done a really good job optimizing around metered services are trading in the 40s. So we're now doing the same exercise for S&P 500 index to see if there's a consistency there. But this is what the data kind of leads you to a bit of an aha around like, oh, maybe we should sell to one of those companies because we'll get a better valuation. All right, as, a, as I wrap up here, a couple of quick notes and then we'll go to Q&A, Zach. Um, so a few last side notes. Um, so you guys, you see my, the screen, okay, Zach versus the, the public data. So if you're thinking about selling your company and you're like, hey, Dave, I wanna sell the company, what's the company worth? One of the things to think about right now is what we call the rule of 40. We didn't invent it. We're just replicating what other people have talked about. So do you have 40% growth? And by the way, it's kind of nudged up to the rule of 50 in the last year and a half. Do I have 40% annual growth or do I have 40%, 20% growth and 20% profit? So depending on the size of the revenue of the company, like if the company revenue is $300,000, the answer is super hard to sell, right? You really need to get to a million dollars in revenue and probably three or four if you want to optimize your exit price. So your logical and upmarket buyers prefer early relationships. So if you have a business development relationship with them, that's actually a good thing. So one of the things I'd encourage you to do is build upmarket partnerships early in your relationships. Don't tell them secret sauce, let them know what's exactly on the website. But most times in big companies, the innovators have left. So part of what they're buying in addition to revenue is they're buying you as an innovator. So keep in mind this part of it. Well, the other thing we talk about with, with founders is what's your invested capital compared to revenue? So ideally, um, I'd like it to be under three to one, right? So, so if you got a million dollars in of invested capital and you're doing a million dollars, great. If you got a million dollars invested capital and you're doing three million dollars, that's even better, right? But there's know that there's a there's because you have what's called a preference stack, right? So when we sell a company, we have to pay off your lighter capital debt because debt gets paid first. And then the series B preferred get paid before the series A preferred. And then the series A get paid before the common, which is where you get paid. That's called a preference stack. So depending on what the terms of the existing investment is, will determine a lot about, is this worth you selling the company or not? And then creating competition between buyers ultimately is something that'll help you uh, increase your price by 40% or up to about 40%. So quick summary, here's what Dave did not say. <laughs> This is a method I can use to calculate my current valuation. No, it's a heuristic, but it's a pretty accurate heuristic if you have enough revenue in your category. If you're a pre-revenue company and you're coming to me as an angel investor and you're like, my company's worth $5 million and you have no revenue, the answer is, yeah, no, this isn't, this isn't calculus. This is a heuristic, right? So uh, if you have pre-revenue, go to the Dave, Dave Berkus's blog post about the Berkus method. It's sustained 20 years around how do you value a company before they have revenue. By the way, it leads with market. How big is the market? Um, so there's a consistent trend there. Dave is actually a, a seasoned super angel who wrote about this 20 years ago. I reached out to him for, um, actually he wrote a blurb for the book, which was super fun because I've been a lurker on, on Dave's material. And I reached out and I'm like, hey, I've been kind of you know a fanboy. Um, would you read the book for me? And would you like give me a, a blurb? And he actually wrote a blurb, which was awesome. So, so if you can pick your buyer, Right. The thing is, you can know that some of these public company comp information is there. We also listed like how many acquisitions have they done and how much money have they raised, give you a sense of that. And by the way, if you're in the ad business, Google and Facebook trade seven and nine times revenue because 90% plus of their revenue is advertising. Right. So the, the trend here is pretty consistent. Um, overall, too, recognize the data is still a work in progress. So if you have questions about it, you want to reach out, like love to love to do that. We're, we're doing a couple things on the data analysis around the S&P 500 index right now too. Um, so my last encouragement is there's lots of things that with a startup you need to be creative about. Um, your revenue model is not one of those things, 
like copy great revenue models. If you, if you create the 16th, I'm super supportive. I'll write about it, but there's enough risks associated with doing a startup. You don't need to have a risk in doing a revenue model. So with that, Zach, what do we have for questions? All right. And just uh, housekeeping in relation to Q and A, as a reminder to everybody, we'd love to answer as many questions as possible. We still have about 15 minutes left. So uh, plenty of time, please use the Q and A function in your Zoom taskbar, not the chat function, because it could get lost in the chat. Um, and then uh, just load them up there and uh, we'll kind of dive into them here shortly. So other than that, um, we will send a follow up with the recording and a link to that. And then also the slides, Dave has already been kind enough to share. Um, and then maybe just a first quick housekeeping question for you, Dave, but is any of your worksheet data available anywhere, maybe in truncated or? or um, we haven't, I, I'm, I think we're probably going to put it in GitHub and make it publicly available. We're finishing some of the systematic view of it right now first, but yeah, we're, it's definitely something that if, if you have a thesis on it and you want to weigh in on it, I'd love to, I'd love to talk to you about it. Cause it's, it's been an interesting exercise to kind of learn like, Hmm, this seems to be interesting. Is there actually something there or not? But yep. we, I have to say we sold a company last year. Um, to a publicly traded company in the, you know, in the subscription space. And sure enough, they were a roughly a million dollar revenue company. They sold for twelve and a half million dollars. Right. And there's obviously there's lots of variables there, Zach, but like your growth rates are variable and your markets are variable, but but the numbers have been pretty true to form. And like I looked at we were talking with a commerce company earlier this year and they were niche niche commerce business. And they're like, what do you think you're going to sell for? And I'm like, well I think you're, you know, based on niche commerce businesses look to be this multiple. And he's like, oh, that, that would be disappointing. And we were talking about where his stage was and how much time it would take him to double his revenue. And I'm like, take the time, go double the revenue because that plus the exit multiple gets you to the number you really want to get to. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, so uh, just in terms of getting in uh, some of the audience questions and yeah. we're already getting a few. So, I mean, let me jump into those and I'm sure we can get to as many as possible. So um, first, first question, Dave, uh, how do you value a company that sells to a unicorn um, and is it the same multiple of revenue? So I think uh, maybe just how, how do you value a company selling to a strategic or upmarket kind of, um, you know, um, versus like a company that might be trying to go public or yeah. something else. I think the, the big thing to be aware of there is, is customer concentration. So if like 80% of your revenue is going to that unicorn, that's going to be like, mm -hmm. like that'll, that'll negatively impact um, we, we always think of what's called a swipe of the pen option, right? So people are like, you could, you know, government gave us official ability to do blah. And I'm like, I don't know that that's actually a good thing because they can take that official ability to go away too. So the, if your customer concentration is a lot in the unicorn, I would view that as a negative thing. If it's, if your product is uniquely defensible, I would make the case that that's a positive thing. A lot of this is about positioning as we go out to sell your company to the upmarket buyers. But the trend here that's really important is forecastable and predictable revenue is really important because then I can make the case, Zach, that I'm going to try to sell you on a future 12 value instead of a trailing 12 value because your forecasted predictable revenue is so consistent. Like you're just like nailing it. Like that's a, that's a big deal. Oh, okay. And uh, apologies. Uh, we had a um, addition to that question okay. that you just answered. So um, they're clarifying that if, um, if you have existing investment um, from a unicorn, does that okay. impact like, yeah, okay, you've got a startup and Google's put money into you. How does it, does that, is that it? A depends on the, it depends on the valuation, right? Strategic, so typically VCs are nickel and diamond you to get the, the lowest valuation they can. Strategics mm -hmm. tend to be less valuation sensitive because it's all about the strategic relationship they may buy you at. So, um, so know that there's just a question of valuation sensitivity. So when you go raise the next round of funding, as an example, did the last round of funding come in at a reasonable price point where I'm like, ooh, that's, that was pretty high. Right. And optically, as a CEO, the thing to be concerned about there is we took a, a round of funding at a, at a stair step price point, but now we take more funding at kind of a mediocre increase. Like we didn't double the value of the company. Employees kind of look at it and go, like, is that bad? Like, is my, my stock option price didn't really, like, we thought it would double it. Mm -hmm. And so just know that there's, there's signaling that goes on to other investors because the investors, it's easy to get a check into a company. It's just hard to get a check out. Right. So that's always the thing we're looking at is like, What's the signal? And, and so it can drive pricing. It may have a halo effect, but it really depends on what your valuation is. Understandable. Um, and then Dave, 
Just thinking about uh, separately, which is kind of a different topic, but 409A valuations, does that play into kind of how you should be thinking about what your company's worth? In a yeah, so two way? very different things. They're both called valuations, and that's as close as they get. So a way of 409A, it's a great question, though. The way a 409A valuation is done is Carta or an accounting firm or a 409 valuation firm will look at all of your data, and they're going to give you a valuation based on what your stock option price should be. So the value of 409A is that it gives you some data around the stock price. Now keep in mind, it's around the common stock price that you use for options. It's not around the, um, the preferred stock price, right? So since preferred gets paid first, that is always gonna be at a premium. So most often, and you're, what you're trying to do with your 409A is not to create a taxable event for your employees. So Zach, if you and I are, are co-founders of a company and we do a 409A and we grant somebody 10,000 shares at the 409A price, mm -hmm. then we know that we're not creating a taxable event for the employees or fees and penalties for us because some third party has said your stock is worth X. And now we can go out and grant that person a stock option grant and say, the 409A said, this is what it's worth. Now, more often than not, the actual valuation is probably 50% to 100% higher than that. Mm -hmm. And there's two ways to look at it. If I'm doing it fundraising, the investor is going to pay for a future value. So my valuation on a fundraise will be higher. If I'm going to sell the company, my valuation will be between the venture valuation and the 409A, right? Because in that case, I'm exiting the company and I'm taking cash. If I'm putting new uh, money into the company, I'm assuming that company is going to go up 4X or 5X in value over the next three years. So I'm willing to pay a premium as an investor because I'm going to get a premium out in three to five years. That, that, that's super helpful. Thank you, Dave. Um, and just as a reminder again to the audience, keep firing away. We'll try to get through as many as we can. We've got about another 10 minutes that we can uh, use to get these questions answered. Uh, next question for you, Dave, from the audience. Um, and this maybe is more pertinent to the content in your book as well, but how difficult is it to get seed money before you have revenue? maybe to finance your MVP or, or what have yeah, you? The answer is very difficult these days. So uh, when I did my first company, you could get, I, I, you know, I sold on the back of a napkin, right? Um, it technically, it was a, um, a, the white piece of paper that was on a Pagliacci restaurant, right, in, in Bellevue. So and we used crayons to map it out. But th those ones were earlier. And now I would say as VCs moved up market and angel investors moved up into the later stage of VC, it's harder to get that um, pre-revenue. So you really have to sell on the, the size of the market and definitely go back and look at that Dave Burkus method or the Burkus method for how to value a company pre-revenue. Because you really have to sell around that thesis to go find an angel investor who really believes in you. But I, I draw the distinction between angel investor, institutional investor and strategic investor. The angel investor invests in you and they believe in you, right? It's not really about the market and the unit economics. It's, it's about, do I believe you can go do this? And do I think the idea is exciting? And as an institutional investor, as a VC, I'm investing other people's money. So I'm gonna invest on a charter that I've raised money from my limited partners. So for the 40 plus people who are on this call, they're my limited partners. I'm gonna invest in what I told them I was gonna invest in. West Coast tech companies, early stage. A pharma deal comes up and then like, this is a great pharma deal, I should invest in it. No, I have 40 investors who said, you're gonna invest in West Coast tech deals at early stage. So if I invest in a pharma deal and I lose money, guess who's going to sue me? My limited partners. That's never a good option. Those are the options you don't want, right? <laughs> sure. Um, awesome. And then uh, uh, again, just for the audience, please feel free to add any more questions. But um, Dave, you know, um, uh, just a question for me. You know, I was reading the uh, PitchBook Q1 Spotlight Venture Spotlight report, and it sounded like at least in Q1 of this year. Um, total deals were down year over year, which may be expected with us entering COVID Q1 last year. Yep. But um, valuations and volume were both up, it looks like. And Series A and Series B median valuations were 23x. And um, at least in Q1 of this year, what do you think that means in terms of a longer term trend? Or is this a blip from pent up demand? Or, or just from your purview? What do you a lot think? of money sitting on the sidelines. Um, and I think the companies that saw so like we just did an exit for a company out of, the, out of Colorado. A, a weird one for me was actually a manufacturing company. They were in the, the, um, the e-mountain bike business and they sold to a big brand that was publicly traded. So great exit. The e-bike the e space is super frothy, right? So one of the decisions that the founders had to make is, do we take money off the table now or do we let it ride for a year? And how do we feel about the super frothiness of the market? 
So I think what you see right now is lots of revenue, lots of capital sitting on the sidelines, making super interesting investments at probably slight premiums. So we have a financing that will close next week that is, you know, the, the founders were thinking about, should we sell the company? Should we not sell the company? The target exit price was $30 million and they got a 20 million on 20 million new cash on the 30 million pre. And they're like, what do we do? And I'm like, we take the deal, <laughs> right? Because it's a, it's a good deal, yeah. <laughs> right? So now you're still in for the next three to five years because private equity is looking to triple their money in three years, right? Versus us as founders, we're looking to double the size of the company every 18 months is typically the, the, the that's the heuristic you should use around fundraising, right? So I want to raise enough money for 18 months, double the enterprise value, raise money again, double the enterprise value. So, but I think there's, there's lots of cash sitting on the sidelines right now still. And, and uh, you know, frankly, they're paying a bit of a premium for it. And big companies on exits, we're seeing that, you know, big companies are buying revenue. The hard ones are where you have a little bit of revenue or you have IP or you have, but you're not big enough to be acquired, right? And those ones are a bit painful because founders are like, we've worked really hard in seven years of pushing the ball uphill and we're, you know, 600,000 in revenue. And the answer is, probably not sellable yet. You really need to get to a million, two million in revenue, right? And I know for founders having done that side of the business is like, you feel like you're pushing the ball uphill and, and it's a slog. And the answer is because it is, right? But you, you need to maximize your exit, both for you as the founder and for, um, for your investors. It's probably why we like to deal with founder controlled companies because when, when we close the transaction, right, the wire ends up in your account and it's like, woohoo, that's awesome, right? And that, all the time you spent doing that is all of a sudden worthwhile. Awesome, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, a couple more quick questions before we wrap here, Dave. Um, you know, there's Tam, there's Sam, there's Sam, you know, like how do you even begin to quantify if you have an idea like what your addressable market is, um, you know, especially if you're thinking about that um, pre-revenue valuation? Yeah, so it's a great one. So keep in mind that whole Tam, Sam, and Sam, if you're new to it, is an academic exercise of research around the total addressable market globally that you could sell to. So let me let me make it a little bit simpler, right? So if you think of, I use, I use Strava, I'm a cyclist. Uh, I had a new hip put in five years, so it became my PT, right? So it just, you know, if success is choosing your parents while well, I failed. So the TAM for Strava, people could look at it and say, well, everybody in the world who owns a bicycle, mm -hmm. that's not their TAM, right? So it's everybody in the world who owns a bicycle and cares about tracking their performance. So now this massive TAM just shrunk down to like whoop, this big, right? And then they launched only on Apple. So their, their service addressable market became much smaller because half the world that cares about performance is still using Android. Mm -hmm. Right. And then it had to do with, okay, now I, my uh, service obtainable market really has to do with, well, you have to be able to pay with a credit card. You have to be able to do it in English. Mm -hmm. So now that, now that circle got really small again. So the biggest thing I see founders miss early on is they, they find the research that says, this is, you know, we're going after six multi-billion dollar markets. And my answer is, no, you're not because you don't have enough money to do that. Like if, you, if you're going after one billion dollar market or you're going after a single half billion dollar market, that's enough. What I really care about is how do you get your first 10 customers, 100 customers and 1000 customers? That is not an academic exercise. That is a, you know, at 10, it's hand-to-hand -hand combat, right? <laughs> at a hundred, you're starting to scale past you as the selling CEO. Yep. And at a thousand, you've built a marketing and sales organization that really helps you get the product sold. So I would say as an investor, I care more about that 10, 100, 1,000. And TAM is an ac academic exercise. Keep in mind, you're gonna spend hours and hours researching it. If you do it well, it'll take you about 20 seconds to explain it. Mm -hmm. And the best you're gonna get is a, yeah, sounds about right, right? <laughs> if you do it poorly, it will send your entire presentation off the rails, <laughs> right? So just know that this, it's, there's, that one has mostly downside. I would rather somebody bring me a 10, 100, 1,000 story where I'd be like, yeah, I kind of like that, right? So for me, I, I tend away from academic exercises, but you know, different VCs have different perspectives on how they think about it. Um, and then uh, maybe one more question before we wrap here, Dave. Uh, what do you think of companies selling assets for an exit versus a, you know, a, a full equity acquisition or you know, or, or an aqua, aqua hire? These different types of exits. Yeah, yeah what's, you, what's you mentioned opinion? you mentioned the two most prominent ones. So an aqua hire is where we're buying the team. And we're basically giving you some amount of cash. The, the buyer is giving you some amount of cash, but they're acquiring the team and, and the assets. So 
and there's a multiple there that's pretty easy to calculate. And, and aqua hires ebb and flow, mm -hmm. right? So for a while, you could pretty much get 250 to 300,000 per engineer, which is you know reasonable, right? Because people would rather buy a team that's worked together. Sadly, if you're a salesperson, the answer is I get zero for you, right? So that's just a, I'm buying an engineering team. I'm not buying sales and marketing. So that's an aqua hire. So you can do a multiple there based on really the size of the team. You just have to be aligned with the upmarket buyer who's your same technology stack, something complimentary about what you're building. So on an asset sale, it's a little harder because there's this concept of a, of a naked asset, which is an asset that I'm buying with no team, mm -hmm. which means I've lost all the tribal knowledge. I've lost how they got the asset. So that sort of asset kind of plugs in to somebody else's portfolio or IP plugs into somebody else's portfolio. But know that you're not going to get, you know, you probably won't get your invested capital back out of that deal. Um, and my partner, Mark, and I work with all kinds of, you know, sellers all the time. And he, he calls me the patron saint of, of lost causes as it relates to founders. Because I'm always like, well, you can do it yourself. And here's how you do it. And it's like, it's just, it's hard. Yeah. Because right? big company buyers like the list I showed you are, they're acquiring revenue. Because if they, if they get 100 million in new revenue or even 10 million in new revenue, they can multiply it times that number and their enterprise value goes up. If you're 300,000 in revenue, the answer is, and by the way, the cost of doing the deal is the same, right? So time, dilution, effort, cost of legal and accounting. Opportunity cost, yep. Doesn't really change very much. So most of the big market buyers wanna, wanna buy numbers that change their trajectory themselves, right? Which is why they're gonna focus on uh, revenue companies first. That, that was great, thank, thank you so much. And um, thank you to the audience. It looks like we're at about time and uh, we got through most of our questions and uh, just as a recap, we will send out a recording later and the link to Dave's slides as well. But I just really wanna thank Dave for this highly informational and incredible session. Thank you very much, Dave. And of course, to the audience and everybody who was able to join us. And Dave, any closing words? You bet, thanks, Zach. So I think the only thing I would add is just on a, on a personal note, right? People reach out all the time and said, hey, will you take a call? And just know that my one question I'm gonna ask you is are you mentoring somebody that doesn't look like you? So that's my only preference, right? So if you like, I'll, I'll send you my my uh, my calendar link. I'm happy to take a call and, and and do that on just a straight coaching. If you're looking for help on exiting, like we're happy to go do that too. Just know if you're asking for free free time and advice, my only my only, I don't care if it's a, a high school student, a college student, a founder that doesn't look like you. I just want to know that you're giving back as well. And then you know, I'm I'm happy to make some time available. Obviously, if you're looking to get ready to sell, that's what we do. So. Happy to help out there too. So thanks, Zach. Pleasure to see you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for attending.